the field has a real problem with looking for anything that's a little bit out of balance. And I'm sure you've seen this. Someone comes in, even in their paperwork, what are your diagnoses? Leaky gut, IBS, SIBO, candida, mold toxicity, MTHFR, COMT. Exactly. And it's like, whole, like most of these labs mean almost nothing, nothing to begin with. But now you're walking around thinking you have seven, eight, nine diagnoses, Correct. which can be so toxic. Let me throw you my few tidbits on this, my few thoughts, and then you can let me know what you agree with and what you don't, and maybe why not. There was a really pivotal meta-analysis from a few years back in thyroid that found 37.2% of people who were on thyroid medication were essentially misdiagnosed. They could stop their medication, maintain normal thyroid levels, and there was no appreciable change in their symptoms. So I look at that in conjunction with some of the functional medicine lab ranges that seem to be getting narrower and narrower and narrower, and therefore more and more people are diagnosed as hypothyroid as the perfect cause for why there's so many people who are being misdiagnosed. There's one small side caveat I should make, which is part of that misdiagnosis, so sure it does come from the functional medicine field in my view, part of it might be from pregnancy-associated hypothyroidism that's transient, yes. and the person just never went back and followed up with their prescriber to be taken off. So yes. that's something that may elude some people. So for women who were put on thyroid hormone when you were pregnant, realize that it is transient in some cases to be subclinical or overtly hypothyroid during pregnancy, and then post-pregnancy, that oftentimes clears, so you want to do a follow-up. But with that one aside, I think a lot of this is coming from the ranges that are just so narrow. But uh, what's your experience? Yeah, I love the perspective you're bringing here. And, and um, I'm going to even go a little broader. I love the Amelia Earhart quote, you haven't seen a tree until you've seen its shadow from the sky, right? So for mm -hmm. me, context is always key. And I want to say that in terms of labs, and sorry, I'm going broad to get to the thyroid. I will no, get there. Yeah, yeah. But um, the broadness for me is in which labs I favor. And I favor serum labs. And there's a certain way I look at serum labs. So yes, one way is that functional versus pathological, seeing through those different lenses and what might that tell us. But the second way I'm looking at labs is through the trend versus the determinant. So how do I look at some markers over time and what's the story that that trend tells me? So I don't right. need to look at 20 years, but I can look at three years. I can look at five sure. years. I can look at one year if they're getting labs often enough. The third way, so functional versus pathological, yes, but where do we have questions there? trends versus determinants, and then what I call constellations. So what do other markers tell me is going on in the body at the gross level? When I'm talking about serum levels, gross level, what do other markers tell me that might tell me, in this case, something about the thyroid, right? So what does the uh, CBC tell me? What does the lipid panel tell me? How do these things work together physiologically that helps me to paint a picture that directs my attention? Because like you're saying, not only can people be misdiagnosed, but I think in addition to that, we don't understand how to look at the whole picture. Is this autoimmune or not autoimmune? Is it hypothyroid? Is it secondary hypothyroid? Is there something going on elsewhere that might be manifesting in the thyroid that if I focus there upstream, I can make a difference in the thyroid and then see a difference in the treatment and the recommendations. And then it becomes right. my job to see what we can do in that scope where we change the markers and then that's what's brought to the prescribing physician to say, wait yeah. a minute, maybe we don't need this or the patient being able to advocate and saying, can I try a taper here, right? So I think that yeah. the, the constellation is often something that's often missing in addition to um, how we're looking at functional versus uh, the pathological. And by the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. This really does help us reach more people who are trying to improve their health. So it, it is uh, quite deeply appreciated. If someone did have a mild elevation of their TPO antibodies, so let's say with the cutoff being 35, let's say they were 150. Now, in yes. my view, that's nothing to be worried about, but that could be one data point along with a TSH of 5.5. And they go to the wrong provider and the provider says, you're hypothyroid which I think is 
vastly incorrect to say a TSH of 5.5 is hypothyroid, but without going too into those weeds, and you have Hashimoto's, we need to start you on medication. And they overlook the fact that selenium, myonositol, vitamin D, as, as I know you know, and even recently, a better impact on TPO antibodies with red light therapy to the thyroid gland than even vitamin D, selenium, and myonositol. So we could pair those together, a diet rich in those nutrients, plus perhaps some supplemental versions of that, plus red light, and then see what happens to their labs in another few months. And that could- Exactly. And it's, it's been shown to reduce antibodies, reduce TSH, and that could stop someone from needing to be on lifelong thyroid hormone. And stress and lack of sleep and changes in the cycle and the timing of the cycle in which the lab was run. And that's to me why that constellation and that trend is necessary. What else do I see outside of the thyroid instead of hyperfixating on the thyroid? And before I bring in a prescription, can I see a trend? that helps me to understand this better because that lab marker is just a moment in time. And I'm going to take yeah. that moment in time seriously, but this is where tracking, and I love lab trackers, where I can really tell a story for patients. And there's something I want to say that I learned in the, uh, the, the uh, case study group that I held for the book I'm writing that does integrate narrative medicine, is that people are really fearful of their labs. They're looking for the thing that is broken about them. Yeah. So what I started to show them is all the ways in which their body is functional and all the green lights, all the areas in which, wow, look how good your body is functioning for you. That starts to shift that story of I'm broken and I'm looking for a fix. Then we From can nocebo see, to placebo. Yeah, I yes, love that. Yes, totally. And I, I, I think it surprised me that people were so fearful because I'm not fearful. For me, the, my labs are a data point that I continue to track. My 23-year-old son like teases me. He's like, why do I have to do my labs every year? Who does this? And I'm like, do you know how much <laughs> people would pay me to look at their labs every year? <laughs> <laughs> That's kids, Just right? Just take it. Yeah. Just go with right. it. But I think that I realized the fear of people thinking something's going to be really wrong. And then where we could paint a picture of, look, this all comes back to blood sugar balance. I love this. This is a story. You're eating a paleo diet, but you're eating a lot of paleo junk food. Like, what are right. you eating for breakfast? You're eating that paleo cereal. Let's change that and see how you feel during the day and see what we can shift, right? Like if there's a bigger story there that allows us to also experience results and not be so fearful. Because the truth is, even though the people that you and I are seeing have chronic health challenges, their bodies are more functional than they're not, which is why they're coming to us, which is why Love they're it. telling us all these stories. They're not yep. hospitalized. They're coming to yeah. us. They're yeah. working. It's working for them in more ways than not. Mm. And I really appreciate, and I'm going to partially steal and integrate that perspective of sort of flipping the valence of how we interpret the labs to be more positive. And I, I agree wholeheartedly that the field has a real problem with looking for anything that's a little bit out of balance and I'm sure you've seen this, someone comes in, even in their paperwork, what are your diagnoses? Leaky gut, IBS, SIBO, candida, mold toxicity, MTHFR, COMT. Exactly. And it's like, whole, like <laughs> most of these labs mean almost nothing, nothing to begin with. But now you're walking around thinking you have seven, eight, nine diagnoses, Correct. which can be so toxic. So we could flip that and maybe say, well, this SIBO is actually super mild, which many cases are, and you know, you're just over the cutoff. So shouldn't be too hard to support you back into balance and, and really flip it. I love that. Yeah, it really does a world of difference. And I think, yeah. um, you know, I just listened to a podcast that's called Hysterical, and it's about mass psychogenic illness. And this is tricky because we don't want to gaslight our patients into uh, thinking that what they're not experiencing isn't real. It is. It is real. It's happening in your body. Whatever you're experiencing is 100% your truth. But I think that these functional diagnoses that we're anchoring on a lot of the times 
become this story that we're telling ourselves that we can't heal from. And again, getting out, I'm not saying it's simple, but oftentimes it is that simplicity on the other side of complexity, getting out in nature, hydrating. I see people who are anemic and I'm like, are you, I can look at their full lab work and say, are you hydrating? Did you drink water before your labs? And they're walking around with a diagnosis that they're then saying, I'm tired because I'm anemic and I have to do X, Y, and Z. And they're not hydrating. And yeah. really being able to come back to some of these things before we go into this complication does a world of difference. Yep. Agreed. And an analogy flashed into my mind, which is if you're on a ship, at least the old ships where I had the crow's nest, where the guy climbed up the you know, the mass and could get a really big picture view, your healthcare provider helps provide that. So together you steer the ship, but one yes. of those in absence of the other and you're going to crash or go off course. Yeah. I mean, one of the areas I'm seeing this a lot right now, and I don't know if you are, I, the talk about perimenopause and menopause is up and I'm 58. So, you know, I'm postmenopausal, but the talk is really, really, really hot right now. But the mm. talk is all about certain testing and certain <laughs> uh, therapeutics, <laughs> right? Like, so I'm not anti-hormone testing. I think there's a place and a time for it. And I look at it very differently than others do because I'm looking at the internal mechanisms versus the, and the metabolization of hormones versus hormone therapy. But the drive towards hormone therapy right now is extreme. And people think it's another quick fix. And hormone therapy is complicated and very, very unique. And I, I just want to say that because I feel like it's, an, it's the next wave. You and I have been in the field for a long time. And so we've seen the different waves of the diagnosis du jour, the testing du jour. We could look at how prevalent uh, genomic testing and people coming in with MTHFR or COMT like it was a diagnosis, like that turn, that ship has turned. Like we've seen all of these things. And right now I feel like one of the du jour uh, diagnoses and treatments is around menopause and hormone therapy. And I just want to like issue a caution for us to slow down all of it. Even when the recommendations come into place, titrate, singular, we have to be in that process with ourselves of that road to A to B. And we can't see clearly when we do too much at once. Yeah, I've always, I agree. And I've always said that if you put hormones into an inflamed body, they're probably not going to do what you want them to do. I do think it's great that more awareness of female hormone imbalances is making its way to the forefront. And this is something that Dr. Antonio Bianco and I discussed on the podcast a while back. And him being the former president of the ATA, the American Thyroid Association, he's pretty well suited to comment. And his comment was, there's definitely a subset of people who think they have hypothyroidism, where it's menopausal or female hormone imbalances and non-menopausal women that are driving the symptoms. And then I interpret that as well, diet, stress, gut, huge impact. And then we have these wonderful herbs, black cohosh, chase tree, dong kwai, that can be corrective. So we don't need the testing because they're adaptogenic. Uh, so I'm happy there's more awareness. And I think I maybe we can, we can bring a more holistic approach to how we support those needs. Thousand percent.